I'm joined on this special broadcast. I want to welcome first Sanjeev Puri, Chairperson and Managing Director, ITC. He's also the President this year of the Confederation of Indian Industry. With us is Rajiv Memani, Chairperson and CEO of Ernst & Young in India. Uh, we have with us Chandrajit Banerjee, Director General of CII, R. Mukundan, uh, Managing Director and CEO of Tata Chemicals, Baba Kalyani, joins us, Chairperson and Managing Director of Bharat Forge, and Swati Salgaonkar, President of Salgaonkar and Brother Private Limited. So thank you very much to all our guests for joining us. I want to start this conversation by talking about the big idea. We've seen the kind of crowds that are coming for every single job that is announced. We saw it most recently at the Air India offices. Uh, we've seen it in different parts of the country. Thousands of people coming at the slightest announcement of a job. So what are the big ideas? One of the things that's been spoken of is the idea that there should be like the PLI and ELI, an employment linked incentive. Like you give production linked incentives, you give incentives to companies if they create employment uh, for uh, Indian youth. So what are the big ideas for this budget which can spur job creation? Because that's the number one expectation citizens have from the government and from India in that there will be new jobs to deal with the job crisis. Let me start by asking Sanjeev Puri first, his big idea on what Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman could and should do, which could spark a job boom, or at least a flurry of new jobs being created, Mr. Puri. Uh, thank you, Rahul. Uh, first of all, let me say that, you know, the, as we all know, the economy is on a, a, a much uh, good, good trajectory. The fundamentals are strong. Uh, besides public capex, there is private capex. Jobs are getting created. Uh, private uh, private capex uh, investment is much higher than what it was uh, pre-COVID. So things are on a right track. And uh, what we're really saying is, uh, how do we create jobs at a much more accelerated pace than has been happening so far? And uh, I think towards that, I think the answer lies first in the strategy that's been adopted in the past, investment-led growth. Uh, because that is creating jobs and always in the investment net strategy there is a lack for job creation but we are seeing it happening. I think over a period of time it will only uh, pick up and there are unfolding global opportunities also that are coming our way. That that path should be continued. Now to address this whole issue of creating, accelerating the pace of job creation, I think it's important to provide impetus to sectors that, are, that have high uh, manpower, labor intensity. And there are sectors like garments, there are sectors like toys, there are sectors like footwear, there are industries which are indexed to the, you know, the, the wood-based industry, there is tourism, there is, you know, retail amongst others, just to name a few. So these are sectors that have a lot of potential and employment intensive is, and very employment intensive. I would also uh, add food processing into it. So all these sectors are the ones where we need to provide further emphasis. And when we are talking about employment incentive, it is it is also you know employment leads to some outcome measure. It is not just uh, you know employment employment led. So that's one piece. The, the second piece on uh, as far as employment is concerned, I think is also to look at the quality of incomes. Because one is to create more jobs, the second is quality of income. So how do we improve quality of incomes? For example, in the agri sector, that's roughly little less than half of India's workforce. So what is required to address the agriculture sector is another, another area. Okay. So I want to walk across to the uh, budget dashboard that we've built to give you a sense of uh, the situation when it comes to unemployment just at this moment. Because this really, make no mistake, especially when you've got big elections in Maharashtra, Jharkhand and Haryana, this really is one of the biggest challenges before the finance minister and it's important to focus on how she deals with it. I'll give you the annual unemployment numbers. These are from the center of the monitoring for Indian economy and give you a sense of how those are placed at this moment. So if you look at the annual average unemployment rate, it currently hovers at about 8%. These are very disputed figures because a lot of economists say that these are much lesser than the actual level of unemployment, but the CMI measures unemployment at about 8% of the total workforce. Chandrajit Banerjee, I was uh, reading one of the articles that you'd written where you talk about 
employment linked incentives ELIs that we've got PLIs it's time for ELIs so explain how you think a scheme of this nature could work in the real world how should finance minister Nirmala Sitaraman structure a scheme which incentivizes ELIs if there is to be one in this budget so in the same way uh, like uh, Rahul uh, that we have seen uh uh, the PLI work, so uh, the incremental job generation, uh, especially uh, uh, from certain some of the some of the sectors. Again, sectors need to be chosen well. Sectors which are uh, uh, labor intensive, and uh, incremental uh, uh, employment uh, generation uh, could be uh, could be uh, uh, you know incentivized as in the PLI. Now, in that, uh, I would think that a very uh, a very strong biased component would have to be also there for how when we look at sectors uh, how where where the there are areas where there has to be a strong participation of female labor force also so, so to say and I would think that I give that priority because those are sectors where we can see higher levels of uh, job creations and areas like the textiles and apparels uh, uh, even in the areas with some of the non-manufacturing sectors like uh, tourism uh, participation of women uh, uh, could be very strong so employment linked in, in uh, initiatives the ELI uh, uh, looks at a number one the uh, incremental uh, you know uh, employment that you create and uh, and and give uh, give respective uh, incentive uh, to that particular uh, to, uh, investment and C, uh, C, I, I would think B uh, is very importantly look at also the uh, uh, the women participation and those sectors and there are many such sectors that we cut across in addition I would say I think that uh, you know, for the uh, there are uh, things required. Say, for example, the grant of infrastructure sector to some of the sectors, to the hospitality sector, irrespective of geographies and population criteria. Uh, currently, uh, as you know, that the three the three star or higher category classified uh, hotels located outside of the cities with a population uh, that uh, of about one million that's granted infrastructure city uh, status. So we we require more 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 of that so so that's one but uh, rahul you were showing the job data i would just like to also uh, take us on to uh, you know uh, one of the other results that we have uh, seen which is encouraging and that's uh, recently released uh, in the clems data of the rbi that showed india has provisionally created substantial jobs in fact uh, in the last fiscal uh, more than double than what it was in the okay. previous Rajiv Memani, at Ernst & Young, you speak to a cross-section of India industry. What's your sense of how bullish uh, corporates are at this moment when it comes to new job creation? Because there are multiple headwinds blowing. There's now more artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, software, which can upend a lot of traditional jobs. So that's happening in any case. And in the midst of all of this, we have a young population, lots of high expectations. We're seeing the kind of crowds that are coming for every job that's introduced. What are your ideas on what Nirmala Sitaraman should do? What's your sense of uh, the appetite at this moment in India, Inc., around new job creation? So, uh, uh, Rahul, I think the uh, overall sort of mood uh, in India, Inc., is reasonably bullish. Uh, uh, balance sheets of companies are very strong. Macroeconomic fundamentals are very strong. There's a lot of resilience in the economy. And generally, people are very positive uh, about India and about making investments going forward. So I don't think that's a, a concern at all. Uh, I would say the challenges to job creation, if I was to answer your question, because it's an issue, there's no doubt about it. There is a lot of positivity in India. The GDP growth is very strong. But it's given just the supply side of 20, 15, 20 million children, uh, young people joining, you know, potentially joining workforce every year, I think it does create its own challenges. Uh, so I would say the the uh, most important thing uh, uh, is is the you know just creating an environment of ease of doing business, whether it is in terms of fundamental issues, whether it's about labor, land, and everything else. Uh, the second uh, I would say is that you know if we can provide, as you rightly said, CB mentioned, and you mentioned earlier also that a greater amount of incentives for labor intensive manufacturing, and they've listed down things. I think on electronics we are clearly seeing the evidence of the success of PLI scheme. Uh, I think similarly, if you can do in some other industries, uh, including tourism, I think that would probably be a great accelerator to job creation. 
uh, and uh, you know ease of doing business is also equally important. Uh, uh, I think people today have the capital, everything else. I think that that is very important. The fourth, I would say, is we need to find ways that we can give rise to consumption. Uh, and that consumption can happen because the consumption, basic consumption, capital goods go, the growth is really coming through uh, capital goods. It's, go, it's coming through government front-ending a lot of the capex. Now, I think you can see private sector coming along. Uh, I think that definitely, uh, so I think if there's a way in which consumption, whether it is through, not through necessarily through the budget, whether it's through GST, uh, whether it is through creating more economic space uh, at the lower income levels in personal tax, but there has to be greater in, or some way of, uh, you know, more effectively transferring uh, income levels uh, in rural India and in lower income India so that, you know, the, the demand uh, capacity gets created. Okay. And Rahul, to just, sorry, answer your question on AI and everything, that is particularly impacting right now the service industry and the high-end uh, uh, manufacturing industry. And I think that's truly a challenge in service industry. There's no doubt about that. But equally, there's an opportunity where India can be, uh, uh, you know, the center of excellence to the world in trying to see how AI, innovation in AI happens, where AI is built out at scale, and many enabling things that have to go around, uh, uh, you know, with in relation to technology that have to go around AI. I think there's an opportunity as well. But that is a question mark going forward. Okay. Baba Kalyani, uh, from the perspective of Bharat Forge, your individual sense of the appetite for job creation, your ideas for what Nirmala Sitaraman could be doing and what you're anecdotally picking up uh, from the other companies that you speak to? Well, first of all, you know, uh, as far as we are concerned in our own business, we are seeing a very positive uh, 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 future ahead, growth, and uh, we are expanding, we are creating jobs. But, uh, you know, that cannot be generalized for the whole manufacturing sector. The big problem in the manufacturing sector uh, for jobs lies in the medium and small scale industry. And I think they are going through a lot of headwinds today. The headwinds are on account of their adoption to technology. Headwinds are on account of their ability to uh, incur capital expenditures that are required uh, to adapt to the new um, challenges that are there in front of the manufacturing sector, going digital, you know, using uh, not AI, but using even a high level of IT, bringing things like uh, enterprise solutions in their place. This is a big problem for the MSME sector. And the MSME sector is one of the largest job creators in the manufacturing sector. And I think we need to pay a lot of attention to that. And I hope uh, Honorable Finance Minister uh, we'll look at that because there's also been some a lot of discussion around this sector in every ministry uh, for the last couple of months. Okay, uh, Mr. Mukundan, very quickly from you as well, uh, your ideas for what the finance minister could do to try and incentivize job creation for companies like yours. Yeah, so Rahul, I think firstly, I, I think jobs is one issue, but I think when you meet the companies, and uh, I've been meeting companies across 10 art cities. I've traveled extensively as part of this exercise to understand what is going on. There are four, I break it into four components. One is jobs, which is the outcome we want. But I think linked to that is skills. When you speak to industry, there is a skill shortage. So I think that that, that element has to be addressed. Then uh, Mr. Baba Kalyani already addressed the issue of MSME because big amount of jobs in manufacturing will happen in MSME and we can't uh, sort of wish away that fact and we need to focus on MSME in addition to what I would, uh, what others have spoken in terms of, you know, uh, 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 let's say labor intensive sectors. And thirdly, linked to this is a third element, which is our trade policy. I would link all these three in one straight line. And the re reason I say that is uh, once you have skilled workforce, they will actually help the MSMEs to produce products of highest quality with all of the support which is extended to them. Then Indian market need not be the only market they play into. They also play into the international market. So we need to line up this entire piece in one line. And I think many of the elements do exist today. We've started off very well on the trade policy with UAE and Australian FTA and various other FTAs are in work. And we need to engage with that piece going forward in a way that it actually benefits MSME. Greater focus and attention on MSME in terms of their upgradation of their technology, ensuring that they get access to capital, all those elements, and also connecting them to the global supply chain. 
The trade policy must also enable them to get connected to the global supply chain, the big companies which can source from them. That will create a demand for jobs. And if at the rate, right time you also have the right skilled labor force, which is available, I think it will all address the issue. The government has done a great job in terms of coming out with a new policy, national NCBT guidelines which have come out, the credit policy of the, uh, let's say, skill sector has come out. Now the industry needs to step up and sort of work with the, the uh, labor force to sort of up upgrade the skills, make them ready for the job market, and then uh, work with MSME to link them up to the global supply chain uh, and in the trade policy must enable that connection. So that's okay. the broad framework. Swati Salgaonkar, the same question to you before I pivot to... Uh, my next topic of conversation, but on jobs, your big ideas and what you think the finance minister should really be doing beyond what's being done. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, I think it's very important that we really look at female participation in the workforce. So if we're looking at, you know, a GDP growth of 8 percent uh, and our current participation, depending on the reports you look at, uh, are anywhere between 25 and 35 percent. We really need something like 45 to 50 percent. Uh, and I think, you know, the gender budget has been great. It's almost 1 percent of GDP. But unfortunately, that's not enough. If we're looking at by 2030, uh, to get this 45 to 50 percent participation, I think a lot more really needs to be done uh, to move the needle. And especially looking at sectors like, uh, sorry, at, uh, areas like digital literacy amongst women, skill development, uh, you know, support for unpaid, uh, you know, care and, and domestic work. And I think also, you know, as was mentioned earlier, uh, MSMEs really are going to drive this growth. And how can we look at incentives and benefits for uh, MSMEs in uh, increasing uh, female workforce participation? Okay, let's now change our attention to the changed political reality. And Sanjeev Purin, I'll start with you. The difference between the last budget in February and this is that this is a coalition government. That was a you know one-party government which had allies, but they didn't really need them because they had the majority. And now we've seen Chandrababu Naidu, we've seen uh, Nitish Kumar and the others make their own demands, which will have a ripple effect in other states as well. How do you see this change political reality impacting the budget making process? See, as I said, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, the, the process or the strategy that was adopted in the past has worked. And that is why India is a beacon of hope and promise in the whole, whole world and the whole world is under stress to grow at 8% of the economy. It has so it has really proven that this model and that strategy works. And I think that should so encourage and motivate everybody to follow that path. Yes, that is not to take away from the fact that given certain uh, contextual requirements at the moment on, on consumption, you know, some kind of economic space as Rajiv spoke about or some kind of financed uh, uh, Manrega wedding or some kind of financed, you know, PM design. Some of those things certainly need to be looked at, but the broader focus on investment-led growth, creating capacity, strengthening competitiveness of the economy, and you know, ramping up investments in social infrastructure, or maybe creating a roadmap where over a few years we can get to certain benchmark figures of investment in health, in education, and, and set some targets for skilling. Of course, that's also a joint responsibility. I think really what I'm saying is that the success of the past of reforms should energize and motivate everybody to go that path and, and rather look at what is the next step to do. Okay, because one of the really government's really big concerns is around and, and, investment, around spurring India Inc. to invest, which is also the reason why corporate tax rates were brought down in the way that they are. Uh, now, the question is, has that led to the kind of investment the government would have hoped for. So I'll show you a few data, data sets around investments. First, we we'll look at the index of industrial production, uh, which has been a, you know, which is 5.3 percent in FY23. Last year it was 5.9 uh, percent. That's the rate at which it's changed. So this is as far as uh, the index of industrial production is concerned. If beyond this, we look at Make in India, for example, and try and give you a sense of how much uh, the new projects are which have been coming. So, new projects shot up in value terms to 39.2 lakh crore rupees in FY23. Last year, it came down to 29.1 lakh crore rupees. So, that's about uh, 10 lakh crore rupees lesser. 
just a bit more than FY22 but lesser than FY23. Let's now take a look at projects which have been completed. This again is in value terms. It was 6.6 .6 lakh crore rupees in um, FY22, went up to 6.9 lakh crore rupees in FY23, then at 9.1 lakh crore rupees in FY24. I'll now look at stalled or dropped projects. Uh, where the value of stalled projects has actually gone up to 18.1 lakh crore rupees after this being 15.4 lakh crore rupees in FY23. And I want to put this question to Rajiv Memani because we've often heard, Mr. Memani, the finance minister say that India Inc. needs to do more. I have done what I could. I have given uh, corporate tax rebates. We've got a... a industrial policy which is supposed to encourage investment in the government at the highest levels has oftentimes been disappointed that India Inc. isn't stepping up to the plate enough. Uh, do, you, do you see that change? Do you think it's changed to a great extent, some extent? What's your reading? No, I think it's, it's, it's changing and it has changed. As I mentioned earlier, Rahul, there is a lot of positivity. And if you look at the announcements and if, you know maybe you pick up the larger groups and you look at their capex commitments for the next two years, three years, five years, it's it's quite incredible. I think it's more than what at least the numbers are much more than anything that we have seen in the past. So I think we are on the the numbers are now showing in the last one year, but we are on, we are on the verge today of probably one of the largest capex cycles that India has seen from a private sector standpoint. There's no doubt about it. And it has two additional layers apart from what traditional capex cycles that you saw. The one big additional layer is around energy transition. So whether you can start that from the renewable supply chain standpoint, uh, you can look at the entire EV value chain. So everything that goes around energy transition, I think that's one massive area of growth. And the second is, you know, the PLI schemes, uh, especially in electronics, in newer areas of manufacturing. Uh, are really getting, and I'm seeing more and more of our clients actually backward integrating, trying to see what part of their supply chain, how can they, how, how can they get more and more uh, manufacturing done, value added done in India. They're measuring that KPI, they're measuring that stat. So that has to translate into higher, and the balance sheets are pretty strong. Uh, the capital markets are very strong, so fundraising is not an issue. Uh, global FDI interest is very high. So there is, there, I, I, I strongly believe that we are at the threshold of probably one of the most significant capex cycles that but we've, we've seen. been at this threshold for a long time. In uh, the it last several good. months, we've heard, and Chandrajit Banerjee, when you and others like you meet uh, top ministers, this is a pushback that CII, other industry bodies get quite strongly. That the government claims they've done what it could, and India Inc. somehow holding back. And you've seen the likes of Arvind Subramaniam and the others write about aspects of fear, aspects of uncertainty around policy, about whether big corporate groups are being favoured, etc., which supposedly in their view is holding back investment. What's your view on uh, us being on the threshold of this uh, supposedly phenomenal KPEC cycle, which we've been on the threshold of for apparently a long time, or do you actually see it now beginning, uh, Mr. Banerjee? Uh, Rahul, you've been showing a lot of good data, uh, uh, and uh, I... I, I, I I, tr I I'm completely agree with more, uh, the data that you're showing and the sources of the data, are of course, most credible. Couple of points, you know, if you really, and, and I think that we, you talked about the threshold. I just wanted to say, I strongly believe we have crossed that threshold and the pushback that we used to get are not uh, the type of pushback that one sees now because one, uh, there is recognition that there is a private sector investment coming in across sectors. And if you really look at data, as I mentioned, if you look at the gross fixed capital formation, and uh, you see signs of resurgence, uh, strong resurgence in the private sector investment. The, uh, if, if you look at the, uh, 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 the gross, firm, uh, gross fixed capital formation, uh, you, you see it's risen from 10%. Uh, up to uh, almost around 11 percent, marginally higher than the pre-COVID uh, pre 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 -COVID estimates now. And also the next net fixed assets of private sector companies that have grown, gone from uh, 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 sub uh, substantially from around 24 lakh crores to uh, much above uh, 25 in, in, in uh, 25 lakh crores in, in, in uh, FI and the F, uh, age two of uh, the of, uh, FI 24. Now, Having said that, if you really look at sectors across like cement or steel or many more, uh, the construction driven sectors have actually picked up on additional investments. Uh, in our uh, uh, the survey, 
uh, with our uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, member companies, uh, we see that uh, 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 about 80% of the sectors uh, are above 80% of uh, the capacity utilization. The second point is private sector savings. And if you really look at the private sector savings as uh, per the latest data of the CSO, uh, private sector savings have increased from 10% of the GDP to more than 11%, uh, and, and that could be deployed for, for further investment. The third part is the cap, uh, I mean, cap, capacity utilization again. If you see the RBI, capacity utilization in manufacturing today is uh, has uh, I mentioned about how, how it has gone up across the sector. And, and in those sectors, actually, we have seen fresh addition. And my last point is really uh, on corporate profitability. And today, with the improved corp uh, corporate prof uh, profitability that's going, f going forward, uh, uh, the net profits of private firms in Q4, uh, uh, which is uh, which is strong, that really gives us a, a strong indicator of uh, for more for, uh, financial resources for uh, uh, greater private sector investment. So private sector investments have started, and uh, uh, pretty much, and I see going forward with a continued capex, and especially focused on the rural uh, capex like irrigation, etc. We would see uh, 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 a, a greater amount of private sector participation. You know, let's spend some time on exports and I want to bring Baba Kalyani in on this because if you look at the export numbers there was a time when uh, the government was really excited about export numbers and I look at total numbers before I break it down into goods and services so in FY23 exports stood at 776.5 billion dollars and that was a phenomenal achievement because it went up from a base of 676 in FY22 and before that it was about 500 in FY21 then it kind of flatlined at in uh, FY24, it was only 778, so almost the same as FY23. And one of the big questions now is, are we doing enough, Mr. Kalyani, to spur exports? What more can be done in your view to bolster exports? A lot of, uh, a lot of effort being made in this direction, but is it yielding the right kind of results? Uh, Mr. Kalyani. Okay, there are, there are two issues, uh, Rahul, here. Uh, I, you know, from the data you have uh, shown. Number one is, there is a lot of uncertainty in the Western world today. I mean, look at Europe, look at the United States. There's tremendous amount of uncertainty, especially in the manufacturing sector or sector to which we largely export to. And therefore, uh, you know, you're living in a VUCA type environment where you don't know what is going to happen next month or next quarter, etc. So, Given that, but if you look at the new sectors that India is suddenly exporting to, you look at defense, you look at the amount of increase that has taken place in defense exports in just two years, it is just phenomenal. From a zero base, we are at some 20,000 crores or something like that, and it's probably going to increase dramatically more. So I think there are a lot of opportunities in exports uh, uh, to increase exports, but I think the traditional exports, Europe is going through a, a fairly heavy political uh, turmoil. Uh, you got the US where the whole election has now changed with what happened last week or this week. So there is a lot of uncertainty out there. But I still believe that at least in the manufacturing sector, we will hold on to exports and we'll probably be able to grow exports. The biggest opportunity for us to grow exports is to bring industries that are closing down in Europe into India by creating some special incentives to create uh, space and uh, you know ease of doing business for them. I mean, you can you can bring virtually I think a trillion dollars worth of manufacturing into India in the next five years. Okay, I want to spend some time on infrastructure because one of the points that was made earlier was that the government should continue capital investments in infrastructure. And I want to show you railways. This is the amount of route length uh, that's getting uh, that's getting added, 68,000 kilometers uh, for FY22. If I look at roads, for example, and that's the point that I want to make, uh, this is the highways built per year in terms of kilometers. So it went up to 13.3, uh, 13,000 uh, kilometers in FY21, came down to 10.5 thousand kilometers in FY22 and then about 10.3. So the argument, Mr. Mukundan, could be that when it comes to expecting the government to do more uh, for roads, for example, 
uh, a lot that could have been done has already been done in the past 10 years and that there could be a limit to how many roads you can build or how much effort can be made in this direction. Because even if I look at uh, the kilometers per day and how many are being built, these were being touted as big figures. It went up as much as 36.5 kilometers of roadway being built every day in FY21 and then came down to 28 kilometers in FY22 and stayed the same at in FY23. So no matter who the minister, no matter how much effort, you know, there could be limits and are we reaching those limits? So A, what would you like to see the government do in terms of capital, uh, capital expenditure? B, uh, are we now reaching a place where all these expenses could be plateauing because how much roadways can we build, for example? Not at all, Rahul. I think this is the beginning. In my view, I think India's opportunity is huge. If you look at the global supply chain, I think we need to build the infrastructure we are building, whether it be ports, whether it be railways, whether it be airports for freight transport, not for passenger transport alone. You take freight transport alone on, on air freight, I think it has to grow at least five times the current number. Port capacity has to double. The rail capacity, freight corridors have to double. So the if we have to export more, if we really have to play a competitive game in many areas, we've started to play the game in defense, in electronics, in chemicals. I think we've got to consistently ensure that the infrastructure investment stays ahead of the curve. So I'm really glad that the government has taken that initiative. In fact, we need to do more. And it, I, I think if you really look at you have to reach even the level of 50% of where China is, we need three times the current capacity. So uh, really, I, I think this, this consistent effort, which is not just a sectoral effort in terms of sectors which are going to be moving forward, be the, let's say, the engines of India's growth, which is manufacturing, electronics, chemicals, defense, all of them need infrastructure support. So in, in my view, I think this focus which government has brought and uh, manufacturing will also get further push from the focus on railways. If you look at the freight movement railways, I think the capacity, once it goes up, there are lots of companies that are going to get benefit from those uh, uh, the, the, the demand it's going to create. So overall, it's we are in a virtuous cycle. We've just started, got started, and the opportunity is multi multifold. And I think the market is there for us to take. How we we can't get get a better get a better environment in my view. If you look at it, despite all the turmoil around the world, energy costs are almost flat. We will begin the cycle of interest rate reduction. It's going to start. I think we've almost peaked there. So I think we are sitting at the cusp of what. Uh, Chandrajit clearly said uh, that uh, private sector is ready with capital, which is uh, which is now getting on the ground. I think government has created the, uh, let's say, the infrastructure to sort of push forward. I think we should continue this process and continue the momentum. At the same time, we need to ensure that we create those, uh, 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 let's say, agreements and packs to make sure that the uh, companies can benefit in terms of trade policy, focus on skills, focus on people capability. So it's an integrated approach and I'm pretty okay. sure that that would be the focus of the government. I, I want to spend a moment on uh, foreign investment. I want to put this question to Swati Salgonka for her perspective uh, because if we look at, and I'll start with foreign direct investment, which went up to a high of $84.8 .8 billion in FY22 and since then has actually come down to $71 billion in FY23, $71 billion FY24. And despite all of what is being done and said, foreign direct investment not going up in the way the government would like uh, for it to happen. Why do you think that's the case? What can be done to address it? Uh, I think, you know, um, there is a lot more that needs to be done in terms of, uh, you know, regulations. I think in terms of also our legal framework, a lot more needs to be done. People do need a line of sight on dispute resolution. Uh, so I think the enabling uh, ecosystem does need to happen. I think uh, also if you look at, uh, you know, the, what's going on globally, I think there is a lot of uncertainty and that probably could have led to, uh, you know, some degree of uh, hesitation in terms of uh, FDI. Uh, but I do think, you know, in terms of what the government is doing in terms of policy, the signaling, uh, and also I think uh, now having a stable government, I think we will start to see uh, foreign uh, direct investment uh, returning to India. As far as foreign direct investment is concerned, if we for a moment look at foreign portfolio investment, which is investments largely into the markets, uh, there it's been a very up and down kind of curve. Uh, went up to $38.7 billion in FY21, crashed during the pandemic, stayed low after that, went up to uh, $42.9 billion and even now a lot of uh, what we're seeing in the Indian stock markets actually being thanks to uh, domestic 
mutual funds, uh, our own asset management companies rather than money uh, coming in from abroad. Chandrajit Banerjee, your sense for the signal the government could send to foreign direct and portfolio investors to make India uh, a more attractive story and would they be concerned about the compulsions of coalition politics and the impact that has on the reform agenda? Uh, you know, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, yeah, answer it in two parts, as you have put it. Number one, I think uh, what we would expect, uh, uh, we know that there is a coalition uh, government, but this is a pre-poll alliance, uh, number one. Number two, there, there is also, one needs to also uh, uh, stay on course of the reforms that one has seen earlier. And I think that's the consistency that this budget uh, should sort of... Uh, uh, project in terms of staying on path of reforms and staying on path of uh, being able to uh, uh, commit that, yes, reforms would continue the way it has been continuing. Uh, th third point I just wanted to mention here, that when we look at FDI, and uh, it's, yes, of course, that piece on ease of doing business, et cetera, et cetera, but our trade policy and our economic policy alignment, uh, all of that is very critical when we look at customs duty that uh, the, uh, the t uh, and, and how you can let a, a particular foreign direct investment uh, flourish in India and local uh, sort of uh, uh, chains develop over a period of time. So that calibration is very critical and that understanding to be given to the uh, investor, the foreign direct investment company uh, uh, or, or sub, uh, sector or in industry to understand that and to have that confidence is important. And my last point is on, on when we go to the states because the states have a very important role to play and the states have an ro important role to play in areas like land uh, which becomes very important and that is something which the foreign direct investment, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that that they would look for. So I think uh, very importantly to see how state policies, uh, which look at land, labor, uh, all of that, uh, the power, uh, uh, all of those are taken forward with uh, consistency would be the important indicators uh, in the uh, policy framework of the government in this budget and beyond. Okay, I want to spend a moment on FMCG sales and I want to bring in Sanjeev Puri in on this and I'll take you through the data uh, that we have from the CMI. Which this basically looks on the year-on-year -year change for food and agro-based product sales. Uh, in FY21, it was 8.3% was the increase, went up to 21.2% in FY22, came down to 8.3% in FY23. In fact, we had a cover uh, recently for Business Today magazine which spoke of the consumption conundrum, the fact that a lot of uh, FMCG companies have been saying that uh, sales, particularly in rural areas, have not been growing rapidly and that indicates to them, uh, at least that's what they said in the investor and analyst calls, uh, rural distress and that really shows the dark underbelly of the Indian economy and the troubles that people are having in rural areas. So Sanjeev Puri, from your perch at what you do and also for from, from your perspective as CII president, your sense of this consumption conundrum, particularly in rural areas. So, uh, Rahul, it's, it's uh, true that, you know, although the GDP has grown at 8%, the growth in consumption expenditure has been much lower. And uh, this is, you know, a, 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 the primary reason for this is that costs, and, and when I say costs, you know, it's at a global level, cost of everything, the table has moved up post-COVID. And in many economies, you actually find some level of greater amount of stress and shrinking. India has managed it better, and that's why we are on a growth path. Now, the question is really how should we, or what needs to be done to get, provide further impetus to the growth. Now, let me, uh, some of it, you know, we, we spoke about earlier, when we alluded to this whole issue about livelihoods, so that's one piece of it. Let me just spend a, a moment on rural. You know, one of the things that's been impacting rural, besides the cost part, is also the extreme weather events. Because of extreme weather events in the past, the crops have, have suffered. And that impacts, uh, you know, in terms of, of, of farmers. And, and therefore, what we need to do, one of the very important things we need to do is how do we build resilience in agriculture? And, and along with resilience, also, our experience shows will come productivity and enhance farmer income. So that's one piece that needs to be addressed. 
The second piece that needs to be addressed is, you know, that the number of people in rural who are engaged in agriculture is, is pretty high. So how do we find some alternate means of livelihood for them? So that's that's where I think it's important that the trust of the enhanced public effects is more indexed towards rural. That would create a lot of rural jobs. And the third, I think, is also important to see how we can build the, the demographic, the, the uh, human capital in the rural areas, because there are there are situations today where industry is looking for steel manpower and there is a gap. So is it, is it time, is it an opportunity now, given better physical and digital connectivity to look at some kind of integrated rural development hubs where it, it could be on public-private partnership, private sector can also participate and, and, and uh, create the infrastructure for training and skill building. And when I say training and skill building, we, we should also look at that as an opportunity to promote rural entrepreneurship. Like the PM Swanadi scheme that was there for urban, you know, it would be a good idea to bring that into rural. There is a lot of opportunity in rural itself for creating some uh, uh, micro enterprises and business models there. Okay. So really, it's, it's uh, really about, you know, creating uh, jobs at scale. It's really about Strengthening the uh, agricultural ecosystem that will that will help that will take us to a higher trajectory of consumption and therefore higher trajectory of investment, employment, and so on. Okay, some interesting so ideas there. Make no mistake, trying to bolster consumption in rural areas, whether it is through income transfers, whether it's by increasing Mandrega, uh, has to be one of the key focus areas because that really is politically expedient and important for the economy as well. Uh, I want to spend a moment uh, with uh, Mr. Mimani on disinvestment because if you look at a, the target which was set, the achievement. So what you see in the bar is the target which was set, which was 1.2 lakh crores in FY21, out of which 27% was achieved. Then the target keeps coming down. In FY22, the target is only 78,000 crores, out of which only 17% is achieved. FY23, the target is brought down further to just 50,000 crores, out of which then they achieve 71%. In FY24, the target is slashed even further to 30,000 crore, out of which 55% is achieved. Uh, Mr. Mimani, given the political situation, the reform appetite of the government, do you think strategic disinvestment is still something which is important for this Modi government? Or do you think, uh, given that this could become a big political issue, the fact that there is a pushback from the opposition, that you're doing away with reservation, that's why you're selling all these government companies to private operators, because of all of that now, we keep seeing these bars come down further and further where disinvestment you know, becomes less significant. Or do you think because the new government, maybe we'll see new energy on the issue of disinvestment? Uh, no, Rahul, I, uh, I, I, my personal view is that uh, for the amount of capital that this generates and the amount of energy that will consume in the parliament and media, my guess is that the government will not do strategic disinvestments and apart from those, that's my view, I may be completely wrong, apart from those that are already in the pipeline. Uh, I think this numbers can easily be achieved uh, given where the market cap of the PSU companies are. Uh, this numbers can be easily achieved much more than that by just trying to use uh, capital markets and using, you know, you know, selling five to ten percent stakes in companies. I mean, if you were to use just one example, Hindustan Zinc's market cap. If I, I mean, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it'll probably be close to two lakh eighty thousand crores. And government's holding is more than 25, 26 percent. It's probably close to twenty seven percent. I mean, that. I mean, it's a non strategic asset. Uh, uh, it is a very efficiently run business. Uh, I mean, the government can easily. You know, take some chips off the table from the by selling some of that in the market and uh, uh, on market prices. So I, I just feel that just and there are many many companies, many many assets you you know as as well as anyone else does, where the financial objective of disinvestment can be achieved. Whether from an efficiency of asset standpoint, my as I said, uh, you know, could be those which are absolutely non-strategic. You know, could be some hotel assets or something which the government may. Uh, there, there is the IDBI bank, which is in the pipeline. There will be a couple of other assets in the pipeline. I think that may happen. But outside of that, I honestly don't see uh, the government getting into that this year. Chandrajit Banerjee, do you agree with that? Uh, 
you know, he's almost speaking like a coalition partner, Raji Vimani, he's saying it's too much headache, don't take the trouble. Uh, do you think they should push ahead? Because the Prime Minister, when he came, uh, before he became PM in 2013, when he was campaigning, he said things like the government has no business of being in business, we have to make this a small government. So therefore, that was at least the idea. Now, that idea has run into different kinds of trouble along the way. Should the government still push ahead? Or do you think, as Mr. Mimani says, there's too much trouble, there'll be too much pushback in parliament. Don't go that route, it's not worth the headache. Uh, you know, uh, Rahul, yes, uh, um, I heard what Rajiv said, but uh, at the same time, I would really like to say that, you know, one of the things, if we have uh, seen the trend over the last many years, how many times have we seen disinvestment targets being met with? So I think we need to uh, continue to have a focus on dis in, uh, disinvestment, A, it's necessary, uh, uh, B, we, are, uh, uh, we should see to have realistic targets and see how we can have an implementation map towards it. Otherwise, just by announcing it and then not keeping it in your graph clearly showed the way it's, it, things have moved. Uh, there has to be strategic disinvestment. The government also would need money. And uh, we need to uh, make that case and uh, really look at disengaging uh, from wherever one can. It has to be a process. The process has to continue. The process uh, probably needs to pick up over a period of time in a much stronger way. But yes, we should not give it up and uh, completely look at it in a different way. Uh, and that is also going against what we discussed in the panel a little while back in terms of consistency. So I would really urge and think that we need to move ahead on that. And that's the question. Will a government which had 303 plus seats would it have acted differently from a government which has 240? There's a new political reality which does impact things. Otherwise, maybe if they had a big majority, you come in uh, after that, this is the first year of the new government, would they then have wanted to do more on the question of disinvestment? It's something that will be tracked very closely. I want to spend a moment on the big picture before I wrap up. These are the GDP growth numbers from the past in the forecast. Uh, the International Monetary Fund said this week that India would grow at 7%. The forecast previously was slated at 6.4. Last year, we grew at 8.2%. FY23 was 7%. I want to put this question to Sanjeev Puri first uh, on the issue of the overall headline growth numbers for our country. Uh, the ADB, the Asian Development Bank and the IMF now projecting 7%, which is more than what was originally projected in the budget. But also the issue of income inequality that, you know, while India is growing at a fast clip, India is not growing in a wholesome fashion that those uh, who are at the top of the income pyramid are benefiting much more than those at the bottom and that's something the government will have to look at very carefully before it becomes very politically explosive for them and is already heading in that direction. So Sanjeev Puri, your sense on that. Okay, first of all, as far as headline numbers are concerned, I think the uh, CII believes that the potential is even uh, better than uh, the estimate of 7%. We say about 8% is possible. And the reason we say it is because last year, you know, the global trade was a negative territory, which coming here, it's, it's expected to be in a positive trajectory, and there is a significant delta there. Two, the monsoons are expected to be better, and uh, that should improve farm incomes, that should lead to a better, uh, a lower uh, food inflation, which is a city part of inflation, which should in turn impact consumption. And because of that, we also believe that in the later part of the year, we could see some easing of interest rates. So some more positives, building on the momentum that's there, so we see there is potential to be better. Yes, the risks of weather events, the risks of the external factor remain because these are clearly modern. As far as the other issue is concerned, I, I think really it's about how do you expand the top of what? How do you kind of create more quality job? The issue that we started this whole debate about. I think there lies the answer. And, and clearly investing, investing for the future, building capacities for the future, private investment, human capital development, uh, public impacts, I think that uh, providing impetus to labor intensive industries, uh, impetus to or solving the, the reform agenda as far as agriculture and other areas are concerned. I think these are some big big ticket areas that will also provide further acceleration to investments, to FDI. And that's going to create job. And that's really the only way that we can solve this whole, whole puzzle. There is no other way to my mind. Mr. Kalyani, final words. Your sense of 
this whole debate around income inequality that the growth has been uneven it's benefiting those at the top of the income pyramid much more than those at the bottom and is creating restlessness at the bottom of that k-shaped recovery well i'm not an economist so i would not be able to answer this from an economist point of view but uh, you know clearly when a country is growing from wherever it is uh, to where it aspires to grow you are bound to see this kind of shifts i mean we are trying to go from a 3.2 trillion 3.5 trillion economy to a uh, 2047 let's say 25 or 30 trillion dollar economy you you are bound to see this kind of uh, disparities coming in i think over a period of time this will get leveled out because uh, uh, there is a natural process uh, as the economy grows for things to get leveled out and uh, we just have to wait and see and everybody has to do their bit to make things happen okay we've had a fascinating discussion uh and the charts that the budget intelligence dashboard put out really gave some shape and context and gave you a very real sense of where things stand at the moment because ultimately that's what the budget making exercise is about understanding where the money is being spent questioning why and looking at whether we are getting adequate bang for the buck uh, for the time being mr sanjeev puri rajiv memani ar mukundan chandrajit banerji baba kalyani and swati salgaonkar for joining us on this india today pre budget round table thank you very much